Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ann Townsend, an outgoing member of the HLI Board of Directors and a sustaining member of the Junior League of Brooklyn. At this conference, we ask ourselves, what does it mean to be a civic leader? What does lasting community impact look like? And how can I be a part of creating a more just and caring society for, for everyone? Our keynote speaker this afternoon, Mark Morial, has an answer. Mark has said, progress rarely comes as a result of being passive. I love that. Mark Morial is many things, and none of them is passive. He has been an entrepreneur. He has started several su successful small businesses, the first when he was only 15 years old. <laughs> a lawyer, he started his own law firm only two years out of law school. A Louisiana state senator, he was only 34 years old when he was elected and was named Legislative Rookie of the Year. The mayor of New Orleans, he was elected mayor at the age of 36 and served two successful terms, the maximum allowed by local law. He was the second African-American mayor of New Orleans, the first being his father, who unfortunately passed away several years before Mark ran for office. As the mayor, he truly disrupted convention. Violent crimes dropped by 60%. The unemployment rate was cut in half. The economy experienced its most dramatic economic growth in 20 years. And he left office with a 70% approval rate. Wow. He was elected by his peers as president of the bipartisan US Conference of Mayors. And in 2003, he became the president and CEO of the National Urban League. The Urban League was founded in 1910 in New York City, almost as old as the Junior League, but almost as the same age as the Junior League of Brooklyn, so I like that, woo and works to provide economic empowerment, educational opportunities, and the guarantee of civil rights for the underserved in America. Over the years, Mark has been a great friend to HLI and to a number of Junior Leagues have partnered with the Urban Leagues, and I understand that his wife, was a Junior League member, and I confirm that. <laughs> um, we are so honored to have Mark with us today, and I have been privileged to focus on the AGLI's board diversity and inclusion work these past years, and so Mark's being here is especially meaningful to me. Please join me in welcoming him. Just close, close it. Great. Get this here. Put this here. And it turns here. First of all, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, give yourselves a big hand. I was just eavesdropping. Uh, on the discussion about uh, the work that you all are doing. And let me say thank you uh, for the wonderful introduction. Let me thank Susan uh, for her friendship, partnership, and leadership. I also uh, must acknowledge uh, my good friend, Deborah Britton. I don't know if Deborah is in the audience uh, today, but uh, Deborah, uh, Deborah's late husband, Woody Britton, uh, was uh, the treasurer of the National Urban League Board that hired me. Uh, and worked very closely with me for many years, as well as Dee Brinkley, who's been a friend. And as was mentioned in the introduction, my wife was a junior leaguer uh, when we lived in New Orleans, and uh, I'm going to have to go back and prod her to get back involved in New York City. Uh, I uh, want to start with a historical uh, anecdote, which I think is important. Uh, the Junior Leagues were founded, I believe, in 1921. Well, the Associate. The associate. 1901. We were founded in 1910, the National Urban League. And picture the time, uh, the early 20th century. In the early 20th century, there was a burst of civic activism and volunteerism in America. Uh, many people were working very hard to change America as America was emerging as an industrial powerhouse, uh, changing from a primarily agrarian and rural society 
as people left the farms, they left the South, as immigrants came to the shores, as African Americans left the cotton economy of the South and went to the cities of the North, it was a time of tremendous social and economic transformation. Uh, on our score, I think it's important to note that the National Urban League, founded in 1910, uh, was founded by George Edmund Haynes. George Edmund Haynes was an African American from Pine Bluff, Arkansas. He traveled to New York City. He enrolled in Columbia University and became the first African American to receive a PhD in social work in 1909. But his partner uh, in the founding of the Urban League was a woman by the name of Ruth Standish Baldwin. Ruth Standish Baldwin may be familiar to, to many of you, but she was a very, very well-known suffragette uh, and a powerful woman and a woman who, uh, in the literature of the times, uh, was, uh, was known as, a, as, a, as an heiress. Uh, and it, it was so interesting in learning about the early history because we uh, went through a centennial celebration in 1910 to learn that the very first permanent committee structure of the National Urban League also included a committee on women. Uh, and in those days, the civil rights movement of the early 1900 and the suffrages, suffrage uh, movement of the early 1900s were very linked hand in hand in a way that I think is important to the history of these times. So today, I just want to talk to you about a number of issues. So one might ask, what are the defining issues of civil rights, diversity, inclusion in America today, or even on the global stage? Uh, and there are many ways to look at that very compelling and important question. Uh, what is so important as we look at that question is to understand the nation as it evolves today. So this year, 2018, will be the first year in American history where the graduates of our high schools will be almost exactly half white and half children of color. The demographic shifts that are occurring in America are indeed profound. At the National Urban League, we have 88 affiliates, like you have local affiliates around the nation. Uh, and we just passed a very important milestone about a year ago where now a majority of the 88 Urban League affiliate leaders, we call them local CEOs, are women for the first time in our history. So we, this demographic shift and transformation is profound. If you look at the Congress of the United States, or the United States Senate, there are more women serving in those bodies. I'm going to concede not enough, but more women serving in those bodies at any time in the history of the Republic. There are more African Americans. There are more Latinos. There are more people of Asian Pacific Islander descent serving in those bodies than at any time in the history of the Republic. Boardrooms in America, while not nearly as diverse as they ought to be, a long way to go. Corporate suites in America, not nearly as diverse as they ought to be, do look different to some extent than they may have looked 10, 15, 20, or 25 years ago. The nation is undergoing a profound, not fast enough, not speedy enough, transformation. And it falls to us in this generation and it falls to you as leaders in local communities uh, to think very carefully and then act on how we are going to be forward-thinking, forward-leaning leaders as America goes through this very challenging, but I think exciting transformation. Uh, in just a few years, the United States will celebrate its 250th birthday. America is now in its third century of existence. This experiment in pluralism, in democracy, which began in the, in the 1770s, continues to evolve. And we are a generation to whom this mantle has been passed, and the mantle to lead the country, not simply from a political standpoint or simply from the standpoint of leading America's institutions, but from leading local communities and participatory democracy, and volunteerism, and civic engagement, and PTAs, and all of the ways 
in which people impact the quality of life of people. It falls to us uh, to usher in and to be a part of that very important leadership. So diversity and inclusion and civil rights are, are very important issues. But I want to spend a moment today because I think it's a big issue that we need to confront within which diversity and inclusion and civil rights play out. And that is to offer some commentaries on American democracy. The American democracy at age 241. Is it an American democracy of fake news? Is it an American democracy of technology? Is it, a, it, is, is it an American do democracy of maladjustment? So let me sh share with you a number of areas uh, that we, as we think about American democracy in the 21st century, some areas that I think are crying out for reform and crying out for us uh, to address. First of all, we witnessed an election, and I'm not going to be political, but I've never liked the Electoral College. Back in sixth grade, I had to write a paper on the Electoral College. And at, as a sixth grader who was interested in politics and civic affairs, it never ever made any sense then. And my paper said, get rid of it then. And even with the maturity of all these many years, this is one area where I've just not changed my view. The Electoral College is an anachronistic institution that was devised by the founders to meet the political needs of that point in time. Anyone who would swoop in and uh, take a bird's eye view of American democracy, and we do have the strongest, the most important, one of the longest standing democracies anywhere in the history of humankind, would say, how do you have a system of democracy where the person who gets the most votes doesn't necessarily win the election. Please explain this algebraic formula that you all have devised. Now, whether you agree with the outcome of the election is not the point. Let me tell you what the Electoral College has done to American politics. So if you live in a state like Wyoming or California, if you live in a state like Alabama or Texas, if you live in a state like uh, Kansas, or if you live in a state uh, like Maine, the chances that you are going to see a candidate for president campaigning in your state are entirely remote. Because what the Electoral College do has done is skew the way elections are run. It's focused, had candidates focus not on trying to garner votes in all 50 states, but candidates trying to simply thread the needle on a formula that their political advisors have given them to get to 270, election, 270 electoral votes. So if you live in a state like Ohio, by the time October 15th comes, you have a headache from listening to and watching television commercials and seeing presidential candidates. You'll sit there and say, what are they running? for county clerk, county constable, or dog catcher. I see them so many times. But if you live in another state, like a state like Kansas or a state like Louisiana, uh, the only time you may see a presidential candidate is when they fly in to try to raise some dollars or raise some money yet to leave town. So the Electoral College has skewed America's presidential election so that now some people participate and some people kind of sort of participate. Here's what the numbers show. In the states that are considered swing states, in the states that are considered to be uh, contested states, the voter turnout across the board may be as much as 10 to 15 percent higher than in those states that are not considered to be swing states. And that is logical because in those states, there's a greater intensity of political campaigning that takes place. People knocking on doors, television, radio, social media, public appearances. I think the Electoral College is in sore need for reform. Why was it created? You know, it was created because the founding fathers were in favor of democracy but distrusted the people. The truth is they distrusted the people. 
So voting in those days was limited to white men with money. Women could not vote. Uh, certainly African Americans who were 90 percent uh, slave and chattel in those days could not vote. But in the Constitutional Convention there was a fight because those states uh, like Virginia and North Carolina and South Carolina whose populations were 50 percent slave said well New York and Pennsylvania you're going to always be able to outvote us. So what we like for the purposes of apportionment, we'd like to count our slaves. But we want to count them without giving them a vote. So for the purposes of the number of electoral votes or the number of members of, of Congress we have, we'll count every person who is enslaved as three-fifths of a person for the purpose of apportionment. There are no ifs, ands, and buts. There's no historical reason other than that why this electoral college system and the system that we have was created. I think it's time to take a fresh look at the Electoral College. Not because, uh, for any other reason, than it is our task and it is always our charge to strive to create a more perfect union. Nothing is static, nothing should absolutely stay the same. We can improve and strengthen democracy. Number two, number two. Our campaigns and our elections and our democracy has been, if, has been infected by the prospect of big money. Let me tell you how big money works. If I were a multi-billionaire, yes, I do want to win a lottery one day. If I were a multi-billionaire and I decided I was going to spend, let's say, $20 million uh, in an election cycle, in the old days, what I would do is I would give the money, subject to a limit, to various political candidates. Or I might give the money subject to a limit to a political party. Now I can set up my own political party called a PAC. And I can go out and I can run unlimited commercials. I can help one candidate. I could spend all 20 million tearing down the fella or the lady I don't like. Uh, and unlimited money. So let me tell you what the prospect of big money does for campaigns. So no knock, who makes money, who makes money when big money is spent? When big money is spent, broadcast organizations make big money. Internet advertisers make big money. Political consultants uh, make uh, big money. But let me tell you what else happens. Candidates don't do what I learned you do in politics. They don't go out and meet the people. They don't go knock on doors. They don't show up uh, in every nook and cranny and try to go out and seek people. They spend their time raising money, and then on the other hand, after they raise money, they spend their time trying to win campaigns through television, direct mail, internet advertising, and social media. Our politics with big money becomes impersonal. It becomes process-oriented. It becomes about branding. It is not about a candid discussion about the issues. In many cases, local elections have not been affected or infected by big money. So I think we've got to look at the prospect and the effect that big money is having on our politics. As big money uh, has been spent, the concentration of power uh, in the hands of people with money and the desire to recruit candidates, not because they may be the best on an issue or the best public service, but because they can put up their own money to run, uh, has become more of a part of American politics today than ever before. Uh, number three, today a tactic that is used in elections, and this is another undermining of our democracy, is the use of the tactics of voter suppression. Voter suppression. Voter suppression has become a tactic. I believe in the state legislatures across America today, in this year's state legislative cycle, there have been introduced in excess of 200 bills that would limit access to the ballot box. Their voter ID bills, their cutbacks on early voting, they are bills that make it more difficult for groups like the League of Women Voters 
or the Junior League or anyone that wants to register people to vote to register people to vote. Uh, there are any endless number of tactics. I think this is anti-democratic. I think this is moving in the wrong direction. And I'll tell you why it's moving in the wrong direction. In the 20th century, which was an important century for democracy, the people of the United States amended the American Constitution a number of times, all with an eye to expand access to the ballot box. So around the time that this organization was founded, the American women's suffrage movement forced this country to amend its constitution to guarantee the right to vote to women. Later on, later on in the 1960s, when southern states used the poll tax as a voter suppression method, uh, the people of this country ratified an amendment to the United States Constitution that eliminated and banned forever the use of the poll tax, a poll tax tactic so that people would have to pay to have the right to vote. Then later on in the 1960s, when servicemen and service women were going to war, being drafted at the age of 18, and the minimum voting age was 21 in this country, there was a movement which said, isn't it only right that those that can fight our wars also ought to be able to cast ballots for the representatives of our choice? And the American Constitution was changed to guarantee the right to vote to 18-year-olds. In 1965, at the height of the Civil Rights Movement, uh, the Congress of the United States, after the marches in 1963, after the march in Selma, amended the statutes of the United States to pass the Voting Rights Act to guarantee the right to vote which we thought had been secured by the 15th Amendment for people of African descent in this country. At every step in the 20th century, in the 20th century, that's our forefathers and our foremothers. Those are the generations of the founders of the Junior Leagues. They're the generation of the founders and the early leaders of the National Urban League. At every step, the step they took was a step to expand access to the ballot box, to expand the ability and the right of people to vote. So I think it's a tragedy that today in America, we see a retreat from that, and we see an effort to try to limit, to restrict, to use false narratives about fraud, to try to limit the access to the ballot for people in this country. It's a bad thing. It's not a good thing. We need in America to remain proud uh, as the creators and the purveyors and the promoters of the best, the most important, the most inclusive, the most participatory democracy that humankind has ever devised. That humankind has ever devised. And so I ask everyone to stand against voter suppression on the principle, on the principle that access to the ballot box is a fundamental right in this country. And that the more people who participate and vote and are engaged at the civic square, in the public square, in our debates and discussions, no matter what the result is, our country is absolutely better for it. Now, number four, and this is a sensitive subject, but I do think it's an important subject. We see, and it's a narrative playing out today, about the prospect of whether there was foreign interference in the American election. Now, if you go back to the Founding Fathers, the Founding Fathers were deeply suspicious of foreign intervention in the early American democracy. And so they put some constitutional controls in place. One of the constitutional controls they put in place was the requirement that the president be a natural born citizen of the United States. The other constitutional control they put into place was what was called the emoluments clause to prevent uh, people who were in high office from accepting, from receiving dollars and money from foreign powers. If uh, you recall your American history, there were bitter struggles 
uh, in the early days of the American democracy as uh, to whether the United States was going to align with its foreign colonial power, Great Britain, or uh, whether it was going to more closely align with France that extent, had extended tremendous credit to the United States during the Revolutionary War. But the Founding Fathers uh, were concerned that a new democracy could not stand if uh, the democracy became an agent of a battle or a proxy in a fight between two more mature powers, that being the United Kingdom or, or England at the time and France at the time. Today, we need to be very clear. There needs to be a bright line. We do not want our elections to turn into a situation where the Chinese or the Russians or the Venezuelans or the Germans or any other country all of a sudden is setting up a campaign office in the United States and coming up with a ticket of candidates that they want to support, to support because there's some economic benefit, some trade deal, some investment arrangement that we don't know about. American democracy is for American citizens. And American citizens should be the contributors, the influencers, and the voters, period, exclamation point. No mas, need not anything else. And then number five, and I would offer this as a challenge to all of you here at the Junior League. Recently, uh, the, uh, there was a man on the street uh, poll. I can't remember what city it was in. And the people on the street were asked a number of questions. First of all, name one Supreme Court justice of the United States. The person that came out first was Judge Judy. <laughs> Name the number of branches in the American system of government. Most people scratched their head and said, branches of government? What tree are you talking about? Our population is moving in the direction of being civically uninformed. It is, a, it is a deep risk to our nation, to our system, and to American democracy. It was once where we were drilled in civics in American history. We learned about the institutions of American government, the system of checks and balances, the various branches, how Supreme Court justices and federal judges were selected. And certainly, one may not have remembered every single detail of what they learned. But the point is, is that it was viewed as fundamental and important that our children and that people growing up are steeped in a basic understanding of our Constitution, the civic system that exists in this country. What is the First Amendment? What is freedom of the press? What is the right to be free from illegal searches and seizures? What is the right uh, to vote? What do these things mean in reality? One should not have to be a lawyer or a constitutional scholar to understand these basic things. They are basic. So I believe that we need a revolution in civic education in this country for our children. It is great to say we've got to understand STEM and we need to understand the Pythagorean theorem, regression analysis, and all sorts of very important things that can give us a profession and put food on the table. But it is as important for people to understand, for young people to be steep, to be educated, to learn, about the American system of government because they are the inheritors. They are the participants. If they do that, they will understand and value the power of voting. And they'll understand that nations like Russia and China, no matter how glittery their economies may be, are not equivalents to the United States of America when it comes to democracy 
and how we elect our leaders and the checks and balances and the individual rights and liberties and the nation we are trying to create. All throughout history, generations are faced with tensions. Tensions as to whether we are going to move forward or whether we are going to move backward. Whether we're going to embrace the possibilities and the aspirations of our people for the future or whether we're going to try to go back uh, to another time. I think that when it comes to issues, whether it's issues of police community relations, issues of gun violence, issues of diversity, issues of uh, criminal justice reform, issues of economics, issues of wealth, issues of uh, equity and education all across the board, that the ability for American democracy and our civic system to be strong and participatory and transparent and open and uninterfered with by foreign powers and devoid of voter suppression are critical to our ability to confront many of the issues that we are concerned about in this nation today. I think the Junior League is in a unique position to take up the calling and take up the cause of civic education. I think we need a renewal. I think we need a reformation. I think our children need to be introduced, reintroduced to what this democracy is all about and how special it is and how important it is and how it has ushered in social change, economic fairness, time and time again. Our foremothers and forefathers understood it and saw it and they changed the landscape of America. In 1900, America was not. It was emerging as the leading economic power in the world. By 1960, the United States of America represented 50% of the world's GDP. That transformation and that change, that economic transformation also went along with an expansion of democracy on an ongoing basis. It's never been perfect. It's never, ever been ideal. It's never been exactly what we want it to be. But we do not want it on our watch to regress. We do not want it on our watch to become something that we not only recognize, but the founding fathers would look at it and say, what is that? It is our task and it is our turn, and we must embrace this. So as you think about the many challenges, the challenges at the local level and the challenges at the national level, I hope we have an elevated discussion about how we can improve, how we can reform the American democratic system. But also importantly, and I want to underscore this point time and time again, if you think about the America of the 20th century, which was an incredible century in human history. Uh, it, by the time we got to the year 2000, average lifespans in the United States were approaching 80 years of age. The average lifespan in the year 1900 was barely 50 years of age. We changed dramatically. If in 1900, the notion that one could get into a machine and within two hours go from Minneapolis to Atlanta or within 40 minutes go from Minneapolis to Chicago or within uh, uh, any amount of time could go from downtown Minneapolis in a motorized vehicle out to the suburbs. That one uh, did not have to wash clothes by hand, uh, hang clothes up outside and hope it doesn't rain to dry them that all of these modern inventions, biomedical devices, and things that we all take for granted, all were created in the 20th century. So we can brag about the tremendous technological advances we've had in the last 20 years. The internet is certainly an incredible invention, but let me tell you something. The 20th century gave us the airplane, the automobile, the washer, the dryer, the computer, a man on the moon, gave us the MRI machine, 
gave us the x-ray machine. The 20th century's inventions were tremendous. We do not want to be the generation of Americans or the generations on the, in the global community that sit back and allow the hands of time to be pushed backwards. Because either we do not understand that the underlying institutions have to continue to improve and be reformed. And we have to understand our responsibility and our obligation to ensure that these technological advances are not just enjoyed by some, but enjoyed by all and enjoyed by many, not only here in the United States of America, but on the global stage. So I offer that challenge to you. I think what you have always represented is this incredible spirit of giving back to community, of volunteerism, of doing it in a constructive way, to doing it in a positive way, to leveraging the resources of your community, of your communities. And you have so much more work to do. Let's do some of this work together. Let's do some of this work together. It is our charge. American democracy at 241, we want it to be and continue to be the best that humankind has ever known. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. time for some questions, so I will try and look for microphones. It's hard to see, isn't it? Stage lights. Okay. Any questions or even comments? I have a question. Yeah, Susan. So, when you think about the fact that we have cities in the U.S. and the U.K. and Mexico and Canada, how different So I think, let's talk a little bit about Europe, right? So, oh, I'm sorry. The, the question was, since the Junior League is in Canada and the United Kingdom and other countries, the question was, how is the landscape for diversity different in those countries? And she gave me an out. She said, you may not be an expert. Uh, so thank you for the out. But I'll tell you this, uh, Europe, the United Kingdom, uh, and France, particularly, uh, have changed to become much more diverse than they ever were. Uh, for example, I believe that now London, the, the city of London, Greater London, and those of you from London, is a community where maybe one third of the population uh, are now represented by people of color. They're Asian, they're Caribbean, they're African, some are from the Middle East. Uh, and, and no doubt the same holds true uh, for France. So this idea of nations being more ethnically diverse, being more diverse from a religious uh, worshiping point of view, uh, is a challenge not just for the United States. It's a challenge all across the globe. And I also think that it is a challenge because of the movement of people and the movement of capital, and the movement of technology, and the movement of, uh, of information. So I was checking, I get a report on our, uh, our internet followers, and uh, uh, I look at it all the time, and I'm always surprised to see that we have followers in the United Kingdom, we have followers in Germany, Australia, South Africa, Nigeria, Canada, of course. Maybe they may represent uh, 15 to 20 percent. And we're not an international organization. Uh, we don't have any international chapters, not yet. So I think uh, that uh, we need to understand that this globalization trend, uh, and so it challenges the notions, right? And it does uh, uh, unsettle uh, people in many, many ways because these communities are changing in the same way that the United States uh, is changing uh, uh, across the globe. So I think it's very important, while it may have a different character in different countries, 
I do think that it is very important for today's leaders, business, civic, political leaders, to understand this. And I'll tell you what else, and I think this is profound. I think younger people, quote unquote millennials, emerging generations, also have a different sensibility about diversity. Uh, they have a different level of openness, a little di a different sense of acceptance. Uh, they tend to see themselves differently. And I think that's a good thing because it means they're, they're understanding and accepting that it is the reality of the world in which they live. Uh, now, in the United States, we see to some extent, uh, and it's important to note this, we see backlash uh, in the last six to eight months the number of hate crimes has increased in this country. And they're hate crimes directed at Muslims, hate crimes directed at uh, Jewish communities, hate crimes directed at African Americans, hate crimes directed at LGBT, hate crimes directed at Latinos. And so, you know, it, it requires us to talk, to educate this idea of respect and tolerance for all people, regardless of background. Yes. Hi, Joy McGaw. I'm from San Antonio. Um, I have a question. You mentioned, as in your kind of listing of five things, both the influence of big money in elections and how that is consolidating power in a few hands, um, and the importance of civic engagement and education to uh, encourage our young people to vote. But I think there's sort of a sense that because of that consolidation of power in the hands of a wealthy few, that young people are getting the message that their vote doesn't count and can't change anything. How, first question, how do we address that specifically in that civic uh, engagement education piece? And second, have you ever considered running for national office? <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Uh, so this conversation about frustration in people's votes not counting came up in a number of conversations and public panels I was on in the fall. What I'll say is that frustration and cynicism is a losing strategy. It's a losing strategy, it's a surrender. And while I understand it in my gut, here is where one's head must override one's gut. One's head, one's common sense has to override one's gut because when people don't participate, you just letting people who do participate have more power. People who do participate say, good, be frustrated. Y'all keep thinking your vote doesn't count and you stay home and you know what? My vote will count for just that much more. We have to counteract uh, that idea uh, very directly, very unambiguously. And I'll give you an example. We tend to focus a lot on national elections and what was the turnout for president and what was the turnout. You look at some of these local elections, uh, not to pick on anybody, anybody here from St. Louis? Uh, you know, they had a mayor's race in St. Louis. I don't know what the turnout was, 25, 30 uh, percent? The low voter turnout in the lack of participation, right, also changes. And I'll give you an example. I was, won't name the state, won't name the person, but they were talking to me about how they were about to run this campaign for uh, a state legislative seat in this particular state. And they said, see, this is what we do here. See, I know who's going to vote. And what I'm going to do is I'm not going to wake anybody but those I know who, who vote up. I'm going to call them on the phone. I'm going to send them a piece of mail. If I have their email, I'm going to email them. I'm not going to even try to talk to anyone else. I'm not going to put up any signs. I'm not going to go door to door. All I need to do is get this 3,865 people because 7,000 people vote. I need to get them to come out and vote for me, and then I will win. Right? And so they've, uh, they've, they've mastered the art of taking advantage of low turnout. 
right? I figured this out, so you know what? If this is the way it's going to be, I'm only going to worry about this constituency. And you know what? I took a little poll, and I figured out what these people are concerned about. And you see all those people out there making all that noise? Those people that vote don't care about that. So let them, they keep making noise, keep raising hell, keep hollering. I'm going to get my voters out, and I'm going to win this election. And you know what? I'll be smiling at everyone. We got to understand, and we have to inspire young people. You know, there's been a lot of activism. The, the, the civic, the, uh, whether it's the Women's March, whether it's Climate March, whether it's Black Lives Matter, uh, down in my hometown in New Orleans, they're taking, up the, taking out these Confederate monuments and people protesting that. All of pro protesting and using the First Amendment's right to peacefully assemble is very important as a right. However, it does not substitute for voting. It should be in addition to voting. And we have to say that. We have to say that to people again and again and again. So I understand, but we have to, we have to say our heads have to override our gut because frustration is a losing proposition and cynicism is for the birds. Thank you. And then Hi. we'll come up to you in the blue, yeah. Go ahead. Um, I'm Vanessa. I'm from Charleston, South Carolina. Thank you for talking to us today. And you, your call to action is about civic education and change, which of course we need. And as you are talking to us, your audience is one of the leading volunteer organizations in the country and other countries. What is your specific call for our grassroots activities or activities that we can actually do in our own communities and measure the outcome? So one thing I wouldn't pretend to do is to try to tell you what to do. <laughs> Maybe your advice. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. So, you, I, I, you know, I think the idea is how to think about how to energize at the local community civic education, civic participation among young people, right? I think we have to work with junior high school students and high school students, uh, even college students. Uh, how you do it. Uh, I think is open to some creative thinking and some creative discussion. You need to use the internet, but it can't be done solely uh, by quote, creating a website or creating, it needs to be some hand-to-hand -hand activities, right? And how you uh, engineer that, how you, how, you, how you energize that, I'm not so certain because I know there are probably many things out there that are working to do this. But it just seems to me that our young people uh, are growing up with, uh, with not enough grounding in the civic system. You know, I believe that people should really understand what the Bill of Rights is. And they ought to understand what it means. I think people need to understand when you're 18, you really are supposed to go and vote. Uh, or you're supposed to go and register to vote. We've got to facilitate that and make it easy for them to do it. Right? I think they need to understand some basics about the government. What are the responsibilities of people that sit on a, on a, on a, on a community city council? What's the responsibility of the state legislature? It reminds me of a, of a story. I was in the Louisiana Senate uh, as, uh, when I was introduced uh, for a number of years, and I, was, uh, I just got elected. I was very, very proud, and I'm at the gas station pumping gas. And a guy comes up to me and he says, how you doing, Senator? I said, everything is great. He says, how are things in Washington? Uh, well, I was a state senator going to Baton Rouge, not going to Washington. It dawned on me, I don't think he knew the difference between one or the other. Well, he had already elevated me to national office without me having to run. But you know, it's a funny story, but sometimes people don't know the distinction and don't know the difference. And, I was in the state senate and you know you try to solve problems for people and I got many many constituent calls which were things that were really about what local government was responsible for or some things that quote the federal government was responsible for and you sometimes have to redirect them because I realized people ne they didn't really make a hard distinction about responsibilities and not that everyone's supposed to be an expert uh, but it seems to me that we need to address this. So I think it's about 
you all thinking about how you can be creative doing this. I think uh, my question to you all is, do you agree that it's an issue? Do you agree that it's a challenge? Do you agree it's something uh, that we ought to work on? And the thing about something like this, it has no political leanings, right? What it has is an embrace of democracy, an embrace of participation, understand and know your government. Uh, I participated when I was 10, 10th grade, 11th grade, in a, uh, they had a citywide essay contest, and the, the only question we had to write on was, what does good government mean to me? And it was one of these citywide essay contests, and you know, this is before you had computers and everybody had to print it and make it, print it neat and send it in, and there was a panel of people, and then if you won, you got called to this great big ballroom. I was uh, in 10th grade, I came in second. You know, it was a very big deal. I got my picture in the newspaper, uh, but it was an inspirational thing, and hundreds of kids participated uh, in, in doing this. So uh, many, many thoughts. I think someone was standing here, had a, yeah, in blue, yeah. Okay, thank you so much for coming um, and being with us today. So you've hit on a number of things that I think are probably keeping a lot of us in the room up at night. So um, what I would love to know from you is what are you most excited about? What out there do you see that is inspiring and positive and gives you the most hope? I think what gives me the most hope is I think there's an activism and an interest in the country. Some of it may be fueled by outrage, uh, but I, it, you know, for people to want to be involved in shaping the direction of the country is a good thing. That gives me a sense that there's an energy out there. Uh, so I look at that as a positive thing. If it can be marshaled, if it can be sustainable, if it's not just a moment in time, that's uh, what gives me uh, optimism. The second thing that gives me optimism is, uh, is the next generation. I think the next generation, the, the emerging generation, I think that one, they're community oriented. I think they have a greater understanding and embrace, and you speak in, in generalisms here, about diversity and inclusion. Uh, I believe that uh, they, things like social justice and fairness are important to them. Uh, and I think that that's a positive thing. So I'm excited. Some people say, whoa, the young people, right? What, I don't believe that. I, what I see, because we have a, a great deal of young people, we have a young professionals uh, auxiliary. We've got about 6,000, 6 to 8,000 young professionals in 60 chapters around the country. Uh, and what I see is very bright, very smart, very technologically astute, very concerned, very active uh, young people that want to make a difference. And that excites me. And we need to nurture that, and we need to lift it up, and we need to promote it, and we need to prime it, pull them along, bring them to the table, give them opportunities. I mostly have a comment, I'm back up again, um, as opposed to a question. Um, so we've had this conversation about engaging young people, um, and particularly in Charleston. I'm gonna give you a, a tip, I think. There are a lot of probably organizations that are doing this, but the YMCA has a national program that does this better than I think anybody else. Why? They do a really hands-on approach um, to engaging people, young folks in civic engagement and government. Um, so if you are looking to kind of add that to your portfolio in the league, look up, um, um, a youth in government chapter at a YMCA in your state, because there are about uh, 40 across the country. Thank you for sharing that. Look, is anybody here from New Orleans? Anybody here from New Orleans? Hey, all right. I want to give a shout to New Orleans. Beautiful. Thank you. One last comment from, uh, yeah, hi. Hi, so my name is Janine Lesseur. For those of you who know me, I'm a member of the AGLI staff. And actually what I really, I'm so, encouraged to see how many of you are not only excited about the idea of doing civic education and engagement. So I really want to share an initiative that we are in the very early stages of building as a national and as an international coalition 
So um, as an association, we are part of a broad national alliance of which the Urban League is certainly one of them, League of Women Voters, YMCA. We have delegates from all the 50 states. Um, we are working with uh, Vision 2020 out of Philadelphia. And really what I want to say is that um, we are currently in the stages of planning um, a national campaign to ensure, this is the target, 100% of eligible women voters of voting by 2020. And so the reason why I'm telling you this, and I'm so glad that you're applauding, because I'm actually going to be coming back to you to really build the grassroots campaign to make this necessary. And it really means that we have to go into every single corner and every single nook and cranny in our communities to make sure that we realize this goal. And it includes, the first stage is that it really does include very, very intensive civic in, uh, education. So thank you, sir, because that is absolutely critical to a campaign like this. And I think the second thing I wanted to say is that it also does include how we position women in public office. We really do need to see more women. It doesn't matter how well we've done in the 21st century, we have not done well enough in the United States of America, in the United Kingdom, in Mexico, and okay, Canada, I think you've done a little bit better, so. <laughs> run, sister, run. Run, sister, run. Run, sister, run. Is that, uh, let me just say thank you very much uh, for listening to me today. Good luck. If you're on Twitter, follow me on Twitter at Mark Morial. Uh, we can continue the conversation. Thank you very much, and uh, God bless you. Safe travels for a continued successful conference. Thank you. Thank you.